Bonjour, Madame, Monsieur. Je m'appelle John Strickland. Je suis modérateur pour cette uh, interview, cette panel uh, pour le Paris Air Forum. L'interview sera en anglais. Alors, si vous avez besoin d'une traduction en français, il y a des casques disponibles. And now I'll go back to my normal English language, which is much easier. So welcome to this Paris Air Forum session, looking at aviation of tomorrow. I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Ben Smith, Group Chief Executive of Air France. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Marco Sansovini, CEO of Welling. Welcome to you, Marco. Nice to see you. Olivier Yankovic, Director General of ACI Europe. Welcome to you, Olivier. It's great to be here. And I see you on the screen, I guess, today in Luton. Uh, Johan, welcome to you, Johan Lundgren, CEO of EasyJet. Thank you. Excellent. Let's kick off. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. We talk about aviation of tomorrow, but we've got to first talk about aviation of today because uh, although we seem to be putting the pandemic behind us, we're doing so with a lot of uh, challenges. And uh, this summer is so far looking uh, pretty challenging, a lot of flight delays, a lot of cancellations. So I'd like to ask all of you just to tell me a little bit about your experience. I mean, Ben, uh, as CEO of Air France KLM Group, I'll be honest, I'm based in London. I haven't seen so much in terms of challenges for Air France, you may correct me, but certainly KLM I've seen there's been a lot of turmoil at Schiphol in the last few days and KLM has had to take flights off sale and operate flights empty. What are your perspectives on this challenge? What are the real root causes and how long are we going to take to get through these back to a more reliable operation? You know, we're quite concerned about uh, the readiness of, uh, of airports and many of the uh, services that support uh, you know, both our airlines as well as uh, Transavia um, throughout Europe and even uh, outside of Europe. So, you know, certain, uh, certain positions and certain, um, you know, support functions such as security or, uh, you know, frontier police or uh, any of the other uh, supporting functions, there's, a, there's, you know, a lack of employees that are interested in this work. And if we do, um, you know, finally uh, locate or find people, there's a training a training delay. So we had an experience at uh, Amsterdam Schiphol, which we've never seen before over the last uh, two, uh, two weeks, three weeks, where everything sort of came together and it was a bit of a wake-up call for us. We had uh, shortages throughout, um, both at KLM and also with uh, Schiphol. Um, and on top of that, there was a big demand for uh, increased salaries because of inflation. So it all came to a head. Uh, and the airport got overwhelmed and we had to uh, make some difficult uh, cancellations. At Huasi, we haven't yet hit that. I see uh, uh, Augustin in the audience, but uh, we are quite concerned for the, you know, the same reasons. We've got, you know, we know security is going to be a difficult uh, situation. We know we're going to have challenges with the uh, police. But one other thing which we don't hear of yet is uh, Boeing. You know, Boeing has yet to deliver us any 787s this year. They're on hold. Uh, we had, you know, we had scheduled 787s coming into uh, the KLM fleet, and of course we're keeping old airplanes uh, to ensure that we have backup, but that's another concern. So I would say, all in all, we'd like July uh, to be as ready as possible. We are expecting to have big delays. We've been getting our staff ready, but uh, we are concerned. All right, thanks, Ben. Marco, have you had a, a share of these tough experiences? Do you share the, the point of view about the reasons for them that Ben has just... Uh, let me take you some, some, some elements of optimism looking forward. Um, the first element, I think, that after two years of the most unprecedented crisis, of course, that we went through, we do see pent-up demand. And, and we were expected, and in particular in the segment of, of leisure travel and, and visit friends and families, which are the segments that are most close to, to willing uh, business model, we would be able already through the summer to have more or less demand in line with 2019. And we're very pleased to see that that is taking place, that, that our operation that was planned to be at 100% more or less of 2019 levels uh, is fully supported by demand at the moment. And I think that that's a first key element of, of high relevance, which is uh, as restrictions are lifted and we are coming out of the COVID, then we do see demand coming, coming back. Then there is another element that has to do with the operational readiness and clearly uh, the circumstances differ very relevantly uh, per country. Not only because of the, the, the social situation in different countries, but also for the legal background and how through the COVID, the different governments have set different measures to mitigate the COVID situation, which meant that if we look specifically, for instance, at, at Willing, where we have our main base of operation in Spain or in Italy or in France, um, there, 
through the four law schemes, we had basically the opportunity to maintain all our staff without having to dismiss anybody in, in, our, in our company, which meant that by the moment that now we're taking back to full activity, um, or even beyond that, because in fact in France we are expanding our operation as we were awarded the 18 slots in Paris Orly, now we are the second largest operator in, in Paris Orly, we were fully prepared in terms of our own staff to, to basically bring back the level of activity to the one of 2019. Said so, of course, depending on, on the circumstances, then we also rely upon suppliers in the different airports. So we have also challenges that we see, and, and Ben was mentioning that specifically, the ones in Amsterdam. We see the ones in, in Gatwick as well, which, which apply. Uh, but nevertheless, we would like to share a, a message of confidence mm -hmm. to, to, to say we were planning to operate 100%. We are planning 100% versus 2019. And demand is accompanying that in a very strong manner. But I think you make a very important point, Mark, of a difference between countries, because obviously I, I, I'm UK based and the UK media would almost have us believe in the UK is only a UK problem. And our, our government about the politics of which I, I will make no comment made a big uh, noise the other day say we gave the industry eight billion pounds you know they should have known better they should have not let so many people go but you pointed out there are differences between countries um, so with that in mind moving to you Olivier on the airport side I mean the airports are getting the the media coverage too uh, you as ACI have talked about this as a problem throughout Europe uh, under under the ACI uh, family so to speak what are your perspectives well I think the root cause is really staff shortage mm -hmm. in the post-pandemic era uh, clearly, we people are not so much attracted by some of the jobs we offer, uh, especially on security, grand handling, because the wages are no longer attractive enough, because the working conditions are what they are. People have to work over the weekend in shift. And those people who left the industry, they find other jobs, and it's very difficult to get them back. I'll give you an example. One of our major airports organized a job fair in an effort to try to get people back. They expected 800 people. Do you know how many showed up? Fifty? Four. Wow. So that, I think, gives you a, a, a bit, it's quite illustrative of the difficulty to get people back. I think some countries are more exposed, and I, I, I completely agree with Marco here. I think the, the way states supported or not supported uh, jobs and wages during the pandemic plays out uh, uh, significantly. And that's why the UK is one of the most exposed markets. And also because in the UK, they went from being the most restrictive on travel conditions almost overnight to completely open travel. So the upstick in the UK is very, very, uh, very, I mean, very dynamic. I mean, we, we have airports uh, from one month to the other, they see 40% more traffic or 50% more traffic. And, and Johan, in, uh, in Luton today, I mean, EasyJet uh, has also taken a, a negative publicity in the last few weeks with flight cancellations. The UK is your biggest market. And we've heard what Marco was saying in particular and what uh, Olivier was just adding there. Uh, do you think that the politicians have to own up more? Uh, are, they, are they right? I mean, I'm giving you a leading question. Are they right to point the finger at the industry? Well, I mean, I, I can see, John, where you were going with, the, with that question, and I'm not going to fall into that trap that, that easily, at, at least in the first part of the, this conference as well. But look, it, it's uh, I agree with everything that, that uh, you know, uh, been said in here as well. We see a difference in 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 uh, in this in, in terms of you know what the countries how they have worked. Absolutely right to, to say that you know we've been I mean, in the UK we've been accelerating the most in terms of capacity because we flew pretty insignificant levels and now we are back up to well this quarter we're going to be around the 90 percent and I think it is the the overall the staff shortages that they really exist across of the whole of the the ecosystem and surely we would like to see also that we have bigger resilience for instance when it comes to the the, the cabin crew but the problem is then that it gets magnified then because of the things that sits around the you know ATC problems that causes flow restrictions uh, flow restrictions causes cancellations because crew will run out of hours or we can risk end up with their crops and, and people in, in different places. Um, and, and um, you know, the, the issue isn't so much that I think we should try to, you know, spend our time now trying to blame, 
each other, whether that is governments or the industry or even within the industry as well, because we all know when we all see and we all experience the, the, the challenges. So I think that the, the recommendation that proposal we have made to the, to the UK government and to the regulator here is to really pin this down, you know, on an airport basis where where there can be a coordination read on what is the the you know level of traffic that we really believe we can handle because it's not only down to the to the airports because they are then affected also by the restriction that takes place in ATC read across to Europe as well and, and I think it's so clear that if it wasn't for some people that this industry is is, is so much depending on each other. And, and one of the most important thing in order for, for, for you and for the industry and for us to make this work is actually that we trust and we coordinate these things and then to sit and point fingers at each other, it won't solve the problem the least. You know, so I, I think it's very important that we now take a very sober view on what the summer has has in front of us and how we're gonna cope with that. Because it's really nobody who goes away and say, well. I'm not impacted by this, whether you are an airline or whether you are an airport or whether you are, you know, any part of this chain and ground handlers and, and PRM says it's a big issue as well. So, you know, we need to come together and make sure we can do the best we can to, to and also to just reiterate that point, to make sure we can satisfy the, the, the enormous, you know, Pleasing demand that we see is out there. You know, that pent up demand is, is, is definitely there and we're over and above you know, sales in terms of, you know, various things as well. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go in and, and, you know, have a view on specific governments on, on that, but I think it's unhelpful when, you know, people are pointing fingers because, you know, government pointing fingers at industry leads to industry pointing it back and then you're into something that I'm not necessarily sure is going to be in the best interest of, of the customers for the summer. Thanks, Jo. And I mean, it definitely sounds like it's going to be a, a challenging summer. And yet, maybe one thing the media forgets is that whether it's airlines or airports, the business is about flying passengers. So it's not as though we all don't want to fly passengers. We do want to fly them and fly them on time so they come back. Let's turn, uh, and to build on what you said, uh, Marco, a more optimistic, looking forward to the future. And Ben, if I can come back to you. I mean, Air France KLM was the first big cross-border merger in Europe. And I was mentioning to you before we began, a, a long way back, I was a, a KLM myself in the dim and distant past before these big mergers happened. Would you say for your group, we're entering a, a new era? The reason I'm asking that is because we saw a very big new aircraft order recently, Airbus 320s, uh, 321s, across the group, where in the past there have been differences between KLM and Air France. There are some changes in the management team and, and structure. Does that suggest that uh, the companies, at least from an operational point of view, are coming closer together and maybe more coordinated than perhaps they, they have been uh, up to this point in time? So when Air France bought uh, KLM 15 years ago, uh, it was Air France that was performing better than KLM. Uh, KLM's done a very good job of leveraging the, the synergies of the group. Uh, unfortunately, Air France has had a lot of labor issues uh, that have caused numerous strikes uh, and has not been in a position to take advantage of the, uh, the merger as, as much as KLM. It's done okay, but uh, not to the same extent. Uh, so that has, that has put a lot of pressure on continuing to find synergies for some reasons that make sense and some that don't. Uh, but what, what has been positive is over the last five years, the social climate within Air France has significantly improved. And that has given the management team the ability to really focus on what's most important, and that is bringing the cost structure down at Air France, raising the, uh, the level of service, and in a lot of areas to bring the, uh, the costs in line, there had to be investments in uh, new aircraft. And as you just pointed out, when you've got a group the size of ours with 500 aircraft, the idea of not leveraging that uh, purchasing power you know, doesn't make any sense. Our two uh, you know, main legacy groups in Europe you know, have been doing that for years, so we were able to push that through. We placed a, a very big order for A320neos recently. We did that on a combined uh, basis between the two carriers. And we also have another carrier, as I mentioned earlier, which is our low-cost carrier, Transavia, and we put that in together. Um, but optimistically, again, uh, I'll point to something else that we didn't think was possible, is uh, there's, there's a low-cost arm called Transavia, which I just mentioned, in the Netherlands, and there was a, one in France that uh, started much later. And there were heavy restrictions on the unit we have in France because of labor 
uh, agreements that uh, you know were very restrictive. You know, there was a limit on the number of airplanes where uh, Transavia could fly. We've managed to negotiate all that out. So we have a much more competitive tool now in France to, uh, to compete in the medium haul, which is where we were losing a lot of money. And that will, uh, I think that'll really help the group uh, better perform. Uh, we do have new management coming into KLM in, uh, in about a month's time. Uh, we have a new CEO, Marian Rintel, who does come from the industry. She's most recently been head of the Dutch uh, railway. And it's, uh, it's my view that we will really be able to take it to the next level when it comes to uh, taking uh, advantage of synergies which are available. And I think that's a huge opportunity for us, which will bring us more in line with our two main competitors. So we're really happy with that. We're really happy we can find new synergies. And maybe I'll just echo what Marco said. We're doing, uh, I mean, what we're seeing in terms of demand on some of our key markets, with the exception of Asia, the demand is fantastic. Uh, you know, and it's, I think, the fact that we have two big hubs in Europe and that France is the number one inbound market in the world, uh, this is uh, really exciting for us. And you mentioned about you have a big order on the fleet, which is uh, the short haul order, 320, 321s, but you've got uh, Boeing 787s. Well, when Boeing is delivering them, 787s and Airbus 350s, as long as the, uh, the paint is uh, adequately performing. Um, not to be uh, unduly flippant about it, but uh, you decided to take the, the 380 out of service, and if I'm not mistaken, it's gone completely. But everybody's talking about this pent-up demand, and we've seen, well, of course, Emirates was the biggest customer for the 380 and is now flying, I think, about two-thirds of them. British Airways has brought back most possibly all of them. Do you, do you regret that you decided to let those planes go, or do you stand with that? I know it was quite a small fleet in the total scheme of things. Um, yeah, no, Air France had 10 uh, A380s prior to the crisis. We had already made the decision before the crisis to exit the airplanes early. We were facing an expensive uh, refurbishment, uh, each aircraft and a lot of engine overhaul work, which would have added up to about 40 million euros per aircraft. So it was a big investment. Uh, the airplanes are not great from a cargo capacity perspective, uh, and they're big. Um, and, you know, we're not slot constrained at Paris CDG Airport. So the requirement for an airplane of that size to, you know, to take advantage of limited slots is not there. Uh, and the facility at CDG um, to have enough connections to fill that type of airplane is not, uh, not ideal. So, you know, with the fact that we had to uh, invest a lot of money, the airplane was not ideal. We were not making uh, decent margins on the airplane. We, uh, we took the decision and we're really happy that we did it before the crisis because the crisis would have forced us to make it. So unlike uh, one of our major competitors who had spent money renovating the airplane, at least we don't have that cost to absorb, uh, which, is, uh, which is something positive. So we totally stand by that. Uh, we, we decided to order smaller airplanes instead. We, we ordered A350 900s on top of the big order we already had. And this is turning out to be great. How we're backstopping that capacity uh, is we did have quite a number of 777-200s that were planned to exit the fleet. And a lot of these are owned, so we're keeping these longer than planned. So from a capacity perspective, we have, uh, we have enough airplanes. And on the KLM side where, you know, we're, where Boeing is late in delivering uh, 787s, we do have other airplanes that also were planned to leave the fleet, so we're okay on a capacity perspective with our Dutch uh, subsidiary. And to, just to touch on two aspects also of the, of the business model, uh, I mean, you have two big hubs at uh, Charles de Gaulle Wassy and uh, Amsterdam Schiphol, and KLM historically has relied more on transfer traffic with a smaller Dutch market. Paris is obviously a big point-to-point -point market. But one thing that I've been wondering myself as we've gone through this pandemic, for all hub carriers, not only Air France KLM, is whether the relative share of hubbing may go down in the future with more of a focus on point-to-point. -point. Mm. Uh, now, I'm asking that one because of as air, the larger aircraft in the fleet have existed, not just, not just 380s, but also 340s and 747s. Um, we know that people, when asked in surveys, would rather go point-to-point. Is that, a, is that a reasonable supposition, or do you still think that the hub share will remain important for the future? Um, I still think hubs uh, have relevance in the future, uh, depending on you know, what, uh, where the spokes um, are going to from your hub. Uh, you know, at our, uh, at our hub in Amsterdam, we have a lot of unique uh, links to 
many uh, smaller cities in the UK, in uh, Scandinavia, that there will never be and there is not nonstop mm -hmm. service to uh, international points. Uh, so we, you know, we are the only provider in many of these, or the options are not great. So, you know, f from a KLM perspective, we're uh, we're quite confident the relevance of the hub can uh, stay in place. Um, you know, we KLM was the first international hub. hub I mean, they created the uh, concept 45 years ago, and in close cooperation with uh, Schiphol Airport and the local authorities, this is the concept that was copied by uh, Singapore Airlines and eventually by Emirates. Uh, you know, you speak to the, the heads of Emirates today, they will tell you this was the model that was used and it keeps getting refined. And with an airport that is closed from a slot perspective, we have a really nice opportunity to manage connections versus local uh, with, a, with, a, you know, with an airport that uh, is not open for additional competition. So similar to uh, London Heathrow, very congested, gives us a bit of uh, flexibility. At uh, CDG here, um, as I mentioned, I mean, the market is enormous. You know, we have slightly under 50% of the local market. So we have a lot of opportunities if, uh, if connection, you know, has become less, uh, less valuable in terms of the average yield, we can put more effort into, uh, into local, which we're doing uh, anyway. And I'll just mention, you know, a lot of these new uh, we call hub overflight, uh, you know, routes are being operated by uh, airplanes like the A321neos. Uh, XL and eventually XLRs, uh, they don't have great cargo capacity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of routes, um, especially in the winter months on the, on the North Atlantic, if you don't have the pretty cargo capacity, it's pretty tough. So we'll see how that plays yeah. out. Okay, interesting. And you mentioned already about Transavia, the fact that you have two Transavias, which to somebody looking on the outside might seem a little odd. And mm -hmm. I, I, I was at KLM when the, the original one was already in operation as a, a charter carrier. Is that something you may... Uh, adjust now. Now you've managed to overcome union challenges. Uh, I mean, you've added aircraft, particularly on the French side. But wouldn't it be logical to have one management team that oversees the whole operation? Uh, yes. You know, it's a, if, we, if we have duplication, this is part of our continued uh, synergy right. uh, efforts. It, that, that totally makes sense. If there's no value add, we decided to keep the Transavia brand uh, when we got the. Uh, new deal with the uh, with the Air France pilots to significantly grow Transavia. We thought, you know, we have to invest in uh, in the brand in areas that uh, are not familiar with it, such as in some of the secondary points in France. Uh, and the name is not, you know, does not naturally come across as a French name. We said the the name, the brand Transavia is already well established in Paris. We decided to keep it. Uh, so now that we're going to have over 100 airplanes at Transavia in a couple of months, and we'll go up to 150, eventually 200, uh, these, uh, this brand is going to be one combined brand within our group. The brand will be managed as one. And wherever possible, we will remove uh, duplications. And now that we've placed uh, a joint order, the aircraft type will be identical. Great. Thanks, Ben. Marco, turning to you, uh, we talked about consolidation with um, Air France KLM being the first big cross-border merger in Europe. Uh, IAG was the, the third with Lufthansa buying into a number of uh, European companies. But it's had a, a different philosophy of having a number of companies that are standalone, uh, even competing for resources uh, in their fleets. Vueling, for those who don't know, is a pretty sizable airline. So tell us where you are today, because it started... Uh, I think even prior to you joining as a Spanish airline, it's become a much more, if not pan-European airline, it's certainly in a number of significant European markets, including a neighbor to, to Ben here in France. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, indeed, the, the IAG model differs in the sense of uh, uh, having a number of operating companies that maintain their full accountability and separate accountability. Nevertheless, uh, pursuing all the synergies that we can achieve together uh, using the common group platforms underneath, uh, from, from procurement to many other fields of, of expertise where synergies can be created by, by uh, taking them uh, together. So Welling, in that frame, is one of the brands in the portfolio of, of IAG. And indeed, as you say, is, is an airline that was a very solid established uh, low-cost carrier prior to COVID. And clearly, as much as 
we look now at optimism with the recuperation also, we were crystal clear in our minds that uh, after COVID, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the level of strength that airlines need to be uh, competitive in the post-COVID environment need to be even stronger. So we took the advantage of the COVID period to do a number of uh, transformation initiatives, we call it Willing Transform, that has allowed us to have an even more uh, efficient models, so reduce further costs. We changed, for instance, all our maintenance uh, uh, model, creating a new subsidiary, a joint venture in, in Barcelona to have a more efficient and more effective maintenance model. We changed our handling, we changed our structure in the ancillaries, so our capability to create uh, uh, ancillary revenues. As a result, we're coming out of COVID with an even more powerful vehicle, and that also has allowed to invest during COVID, and the example of Paris Orly is one where we could expand significantly our operation. In fact, with a growth of 50% of our operation, we have four aircraft additionally based in Paris or Lee, thanks to the fact that we were, uh, let's say, uh, awarded the, the uh, Orly slot. So a vehicle that uh, has a footprint that goes beyond Spain, indeed, as you say, wherever the opportunity is uh, allowed to have sustainable growth, we are capturing that. And the example of, of, of uh, Orly was a very uh, crystal clear one, and we will continue pursuing that. And I have to say, one key element uh, in coming out stronger as an organization, I was mentioning the fact that uh, it has been essential to rely upon the legal frameworks that we had in the different countries, but also I think equally relevant has been the, the, the availability of our staff uh, to support that, because that meant a huge sacrifice of all our people, both in, in, in every basis that we had, and the fact that now we are capable to restart operating at 100% is thanks to all these people that during these years have basically hold together at, at Welling and made possible now to come into a new phase. Of course, they are also part of, of the designing of, of the new Welling in the sense that uh, we have to ensure that in the long term our labor costs remain competitive. So we are engaging with them to ensure that that sustainability remains also longer term. And, and operating here in France, uh, uh, do you view uh, Transavia as a serious competitor? And Ben, do you regard Welling as a serious competitor in that segment? Marco? For us, certainly is. I mean, one of the things that we did in, in Orly was to, in fact, broaden a lot the network. We have now operating 50, well, 48 destinations, many of which were not served. In fact, Paris Orly being a constrained airport, uh, the fact that we could access these lots implied not only to have a more competitive balance in the airport, where, of course, the role of the Air France KLM group together with Transavia is prominent, but also to expand the number of destinations. So that meant both for the, the market, but also for tourism, uh, to broaden uh, the, the, the number of opportunities. And certainly, uh, this is healthy competition, and, and we like to compete because we believe we are strong and capable to compete. So competition is healthy. Excellent. So, Yohan, uh, uh, I feel sorry because you're sitting there in Luton. I haven't forgotten you, uh, but uh, I'm just trying to get, get around uh, everybody with all the interesting stuff that's coming out. You're also a big player in France. I mean, the UK is your biggest market, but you have bases here in Paris at both Orly and Charles de Gaulle. You have regional bases at a number of large French airports as well. Tell us how you see EasyJet's future in terms of competition as we hopefully put the COVID challenge behind us. Yes, I, I think that look, look like uh, any one of my, my competitors there in the industry, you know, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, you know, everybody's been doing whatever they can to get through the pandemic, but also to, to sharpen up the competitiveness, both in terms of whether that is cost, whether that is revenue, and then also the, the way we you know, ultimately can engage with our customers in a, in, a, in a great way. And, you know, we're ready to compete as we're coming out of this one. And, and France is a very important market for ourselves with the second largest airline in terms of you know, a, a number of the bases where we're operating from. We're larger than we've ever been before in Paris, and we're connecting the regions with you know more international flying than any other airline. So, you know, we, we look to continue up on that. But I think it's also important to say that we are taking the view like like most others that you know it's really important coming out of the the losses that we're now seeing for for this you know lengthy period of time that we also you know do, do whatever we can to to deliver shareholder value to deliver returns and and that will take into effect uh, and, and to account the fact that we're also optimizing the network we will seem to want to fly more where we have the stronger returns and we will fly less where we see lesser returns and i think that the the normal patience that any company would have in terms of you know wanting to mature less profitable basis isn't there to the same extent we, we know that there is a consolidation taking place in the market from an 
organic point of view, I think for European short pull this summer, the last time I looked, it was about 7% uh, less capacity versus 2019. And, and across the network where we operate in, that is you know, also even more. So we see opportunities in there, and we're going to be absolutely focused also on making sure that we we return back to profitability as quick as possible then, and then really focusing on, on continuing to grow from from there. So I, I do think that, you know, coming out of this pandemic with all the difficulties and the challenges and a huge number of airlines has, you know, tremendous a lot of debts uh, still to need to be repaid, um, that there are certain things where the industry will come out in, in a better way. The debt doesn't help, particularly when we come on, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that sustainability uh, and, and, you know, the cost of transitioning into a decarbonized industry that we all need to do. Uh, I think that made that even more difficult. But I do think in, in general that everybody has done what they can to sharpen up the competitiveness. And, and just to echo the, the point that was made, that's the way it should be. Competition is good for consumers. This is a highly, highly, you know, uh, competitive industry to be in. And, um, you know, uh, may, may the best company win in that. That is the ultimately the best for the consumers. And that's what we are looking to do. I mean, yeah, and you mentioned there about uh, competition. You know, just a, a, a blunt question for you. Are you the hunter or are, are you the hunted? Because, uh, you know, last year there were rumors about a possible takeover bid by, by Wizz Air for EasyJet. Now, Wizz, ne Wizz Air never confirmed or denied it. You never confirmed or denied it. But it's, it was circulating around. It would seem to me if any airline was going to do it, Wizz Air would be the most logical. And you, I remember talking with you another time when you mentioned, just as you did now, about seeking shareholder value. Uh, is that a possibility? I mean, you're the second biggest low-cost airline in Europe. You're bigger than Wizz Air currently. But could we see consolidation and have less uh, of the low-cost uh, uh, carriers than we have today? Yeah, I, by the way, I also heard about that rumor, by the way. Uh, but uh, listen, the, the, uh, the, the point is that I, I think most airlines, most companies have been on one hand completely focused on, you know, getting through is that that we have seen, you know, that that's where I think that the main game has, has always been about as well. I mean, we feel very confident in our standalone plans. There's uh, not any one that we need to acquire or, or in order to get us where we want to do. But at the same time, we're not against transactions as, as such. But they need to do two things: they need to deliver value to the shareholders. And, and then also, if you decide that this is what you want to recommend to the shareholders, you also need to have a great degree of confidence that you actually can deliver upon whatever transaction that, that is out there. But I, I'm, I'm not so sure that there was going to be this big wave of, of, of transactions taking place. I mean, you will not, and, or from what I can tell, never get to the situation with the consolidated market that you see in the U.S. as an example, just because of the structure and the support that governments are giving to to a number of of their you know the, their what they call the flagship uh, carriers. Now, uh, so I think that that would be also then restricted in terms of you know a lot of the the debt that has been you know. Uh, being a consequence of loans and grants that's been given, or actually loans rather than grants, I should point out. Um, so that restricts the number of players in there, um, and that takes out quite a lot of you know you know people and companies in in that market space. But certainly from an EasyJet perspective, we feel very confident in our standalone place. But look, if there's an opportunity that that delivers you know great value to shareholders, you feel confident you can deliver about it. Then then of course everything should be on the table. Uh, ben, you, you hear what uh, Yoan is saying there. I mean, I, I, I don't really feel to ask you the same question, hunter or hunted, but as the first big cross-border merger in Europe, you've been less on the acquisition trail. I mentioned that Lufthansa went and uh, bought into, in some ways, Germanic surrounding companies in, in neighboring countries largely. Uh, IAG was formed. Uh, I just discussed with Willie Walsh an hour ago about IAG's role as a consolidator. We see now potentially one or two areas of interest, the Alitalia successor, ETA, but as Yoan just mentioned, some players are inhibited in what they can do. Uh, and I would see that Air France KLM is one because of the government funding you've taken as part of this pandemic. But you're working hard now to pay down this debt and to take on private equity. Is that partly not only to have a, a cleaner balance sheet because you do see these opportunities and you would like to have the freedom to go after them? 
Yeah, no, we're obviously uh, extremely grateful to both the Dutch state and the French state for you know, supporting us with stabilizing uh, loans. You know, it's very frustrating when we're not the ones in charge of closing borders and we have to keep our operations running or at least paying our staff. So that being said, we are focused you know, as quickly as possible to, uh, to get ourselves out of this. Um, you know, unfortunately, there were really heavy uh, remedies imposed uh, by the European Commission uh, for these uh, to go through, and one of them was the release of some slots at to help Ali, Marco out. which uh, helped Marco <laughs> out. But uh, nevertheless, we still have a very good position uh, at Ali. Um, so uh, consolidation-wise, well, look, we, we've been looking at Italy for a while. Um, our groups had two negative experiences in Italy. KLM and then Air France KLM did invest uh, a lot of money into both, in, you know, into the carrier two times and lost all of that. So to do it a third time, it would have to, we'd have to be pretty convinced that, uh, that the opportunity was lower risk than we've had in the past. Uh, so we're looking at them very carefully. There's some other independent carriers uh, in Europe that we continue to study. We do have the ability to put, uh, you know, to make a 10% um, investment while we're under these restrictions. However, we're hopeful we can get out of them uh, relatively quickly. We have done two transactions recently. We just uh, signed a fantastic uh, joint venture agreement with the third largest maritime company in the world, CMA CGM, and you know, we've convinced them to, uh, to actually join our capital structure. They're going to buy 9% um, of Air France KLM, and we believe that this is a fantastic opportun opportunity to be a leader in the uh, I'd say the consolidation, or not really the consolidation, but further vertical integration of this uh, business. Um, you know, the last two years, cargo has been amazing for everyone, in particular for them. Uh, we've had great uh, results on the cargo side. Uh, so we see this, you know, having a complementary partner who are, you know, also looking to do, um, you know, to push the barrier in terms of what can, what can we do on the cargo front in the future. We're really happy about that. And we've also just announced a, um, a, you know, a very unique monetization, first of its kind, of our engines on the Air France side, also to bring uh, new equity in. Uh, so we're, 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 I think we're well on our way. We, we launched last week a recapitalization, which should terminate in the, couple of, in the next couple of days. And so far, it's looking pretty good. So I would, uh, I would say sooner the better, so that you know, if there are interesting opportunities out there for us to participate, uh, in consolidation, we'll certainly look at it. But I'll just restate again, we do have this new tool, uh, which has a, an enormous amount of flexibility now, which is Transavia. Transavia. And there, you know, some of our competitors, uh, one on the screen and one right here, we've now got a tool that we never had in, in the past. And they do have quite a position in France that uh, we believe with the assets we have, such as our loyalty program, that you know, we would be able to gain, uh, regain a position in some of these, uh, some of these airports. Do you think, by the way, Ben, do you think you're better placed in what you've got with Transavia, and this again is one of my occasional leading questions, than, say, Lufthansa with Eurowings? Because Eurowings has several operating certificates and various complexities. Uh, do you think you're in a better position? Uh, I do. I think we've got a better cost structure, which is more competitive, and we have uh, better opportunities. You know, Air France, KLM, the group, uh, including you know the Transavia brand, we operate no European services uh, from the secondary markets in France, and there are quite a few. So I'm talking about Toulouse, Marseille, uh, Nice, Lyon, uh, you know Baldo. Uh, these are relatively large cities where our group has zero presence uh, on flights to uh, to Europe. We fly domestically, but uh, nothing to Europe. So we do have a lot of customers in those uh, cities that you know, we have good share up to Paris and connections to long haul. Uh, and they are captive members of our loyalty program. So we're going to, in a, you know, in a balanced way, leverage that, that program to, uh, to be able to enter into new European markets from, uh, from these, uh, these big and important uh, cities in France. Interesting. Olivier, I haven't forgotten you. The airport side is a, a key partner in this uh, industry of ours. What about the challenges and what about the opportunities for the future of airports? Because you know, you've got a very broad church. You have large established hub airports right through to uh, very small regional airports, which really survive by being key economic tools. They can't truly make money. But uh, has COVID brought about a big change in philosophy in terms of 
what you're able to invest in, how you'll invest, the number of airports for the future, and what kind of airlines you're, you're serving? Well, I, I think for now, still, uh, two years after the pandemic started, the biggest challenge for airports, and it's a systemic challenge across the entire European airport network, is uh, the weakness in terms of financial terms. Uh, you know, airports made uh, massive losses, historic losses in 2020, 2021. Many will make losses against this year. We didn't get the kind of financial support that airlines or some airlines got in Europe. Uh, if we look at all of Europe's airports, we got 4.9 billion euro in direct financial support versus 38 billion euro for airlines. If I compare to US airports, who got close to 40 billion dollars, I mean, the gap is even wider. Uh, so that left airport with uh, only one option was to have massive recourse to debt. Uh, debt increased by 200% on average for Europe's airports. And that is what for many airports kept paying for operations. Uh, so I think the, the difficulty is that now, of course, you know, we see a pent up demand, we see traffic coming back and that's great. But uh, I think you have to keep in mind also that for airports at the moment, the recovery is rather cost, cost intensive and quite revenue weak because actually a lot of the traffic is coming over peak period. But actually, the overall volume are still lower than what we had in 2019 before the pandemic. I mean, uh, from up to end of, of April, we were still 35% below passenger volumes compared to 2019. So that leaves us with a big question is how are we going to be able to keep investing in the future? And at the moment, there's not much margin for that. I mean, we, we, we looked at that in depth and we found out that on aggregate terms across the European airport industry, we don't see revenue to be back at the level we need to keep the investment going before 2032. And that's a major risk, not just for airports, but of course for our partners, but also for the European economy, because we know airports are massive engines of local development and, and job creation. So I think that's, that's the big question mark we have, how we are gonna be able to restore revenue generation to a level that will allow us to investing again, knowing that, of course, the investment profile will be different to what we've done in the past. And in terms of, uh, there's always been a challenge between uh, planning timeframes between airlines and airports. Uh, airlines tend to make decisions more dynamically at the last minute, even more so now through this crisis. And you've got to build infrastructure, whether it's for A380s, A350s, or 320s, short haul, low cost models. Are there ways in which uh, airports can be designed to have the same flexibility, let's say, that a short-haul business class cabin has, where you can move the curtain up and down. Is, is there some way you can design infrastructure that you can flex it more, uh, which is going to help you in capital expenditure terms, but is also going to be more responsive to different Sure, I think, I think we see airports looking at this much more flexibly, more in-time investment. Uh, I mean, we're forced by that because the planning horizon has shortened tremendously. Uh, but I think uh, be, beyond that, we, we see the where we invest, this is changing. I mean, obviously in the next year, we're gonna to have to invest much less on capacity and much more on sustainability, innovation, digitalization uh, to bring more operational efficiency. So I think the investment needs are not less, they are just different. Just to give you a figure, uh, we looked at what would be required in terms of capex from airports to uh, decarbonize all the terminal operations across Europe. That's 26 billion euro needed of investment. So that's a major challenge moving forward. Could, could there be a change in philosophy? And I'm very conscious the clock is really beating us. I've scarcely scratched the surface of what I wanted to ask all of you. But could airlines and airports work more closely together in the, the non-aeronautical revenues, not the issue of landing fees, but the retail, the parking? Uh, could you, as a joint force, become you know, a more Amazon-like future <laughs> entity where you both get more out of a pie yeah. than you both currently do? I've always been surprised by the fact that indeed airports and airlines don't work together to develop commercial opportunities at airports. Uh, you know, we, we fight a lot about the pie, but I think there's a lot to gain in working together to grow the pie together. I think one of the reasons for me in, in the inability for both sides to come together and work it out is the regulatory framework we're under because as airports, we're heavily regulated, although we're no longer monopolies. This is a vision of the past. We compete with each other heavily to attract services from Welling, from Transavia and other major carriers. Uh, but still, we're very heavily regulated. And I think the regulatory framework in Europe and in many countries tends to create conflict rather than incentivize cooperation between airports and airlines. And that, that would need to change.
Well, listen, the clock really has beaten us. So with that positive note, I'll say thank you to you, uh, Olivier. Just a, a quick bright note for the future, a very quick from each of the airline guys. Marco, uh, what's your last brief reflection? Aviation will be sustainable. Uh, we believe in that. We are investing heavily in that. It's a long path, but step by step, uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, renovation of the fleet, uh, all the things that we're doing step by step will get there. We need to educate everybody that the solution is not killing aviation, it's make it that, uh, making it sustainable. There are true plans to make it happen. We just need to mobilize all the forces to get there. Thank you very much, Marco. Ben? Uh, well, what Marco just said is a key priority for us, obviously, in the, the whole industry. But uh, what's been a, you know, a very pleasant surprise for us is how quickly demand has come back. Uh, and you know, speaking to our customers, uh, we think it's going to come back much faster than expected. Uh, you know, we had you know, close to our biggest sales day uh, ever in the company a couple of weeks ago when our partner Delta actually had its best sales day in the history of its airline uh, two weeks ago. So we're, uh, we're very bullish on, uh, on traffic demand uh, going forward. Great. Thanks, Ben. And Yoan, last, last word to you on the airline side. Well, I, I could echo all of that as well. Look, we are firmly in, in, into the stage of the, the recovery, having come through all of the industry survival phase. And, you know, from that, you will see growth phase happening. And I mean, the, the, it, it might sound counterintuitive, but, you know, speaking about the decarbonization, I think that the Euro control studies that's been made on this shows that the most efficient way to decarbonize actually assumes higher growth than what is currently in the plan because the industry needs the revenue in order to make that transition happen. And I'm pretty sure that is what's going to happen as well. So we are, we are very, very confident about the future of innovation and also particularly for ourselves. Great. Jon Lundgren, C Lund Lundgren, CEO of EasyJet, thank you very much. Ben Smith, Group CEO of Air France, KLM, thank you to you. Marco Sansovini, Vueling CEO, equally thanks to you. And Olivia Jankovic, Director General of ACI Europe, thanks to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your attention today. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Bonne fin de journée. <laughs>